was the parish priest in Cartagena who sees one of the pieces of documentation that is, that is filed as part of somebody getting married in the Spanish colonial world. That priest had, during the course of his long career, been in Merida for a while. And he actually remembers that there was a guy called Manuel Bolio who he thought was married to a Maya woman called something La Monja. I, I'm sure it's the nickname was what tripped him up. If it wasn't for that nickname, he might not have remembered it. So, um, using the postal service, <laughs> he uh, it takes, as you could probably to guess, how long it takes for, for the correspondence to get back and forth here. It's 17, 1776 is when he first formally proposes marriage to the woman who would have been his third wife. 1777 down here is when an investigation into, into possible bigamy gets opened by the Inquisition. This is the first page of his uh, Inquisition case file. And in 1778, he's arrested. So it's two years of letters, during which time over two years you can exchange, what, four letters maybe? Yeah, from Cartagena up to, to, and it's not like they're putting on a ship and then they're just sailing right there. They're sort of going like that. He gets arrested, he gets tried um, for bigamy, and he gets condemned to slavery and to serving on His Majesty's galleys. He also gets condemned to 200 lashes, which is standard um, punishment for a bigamist. But I don't think, certainly not in the 18th century, anybody in the Spanish world has been given 200 lashes for bigamy. 200 lashes is a lot. I mean, I don't know about you, but I think I'd probably survive maybe like three. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think you can survive 200. I think they're just saying that, so people go, oh no, no, I'm really, really sorry. Okay, don't worry about the lashes. Now you're on the His Majesty's galley. So um, there's a kind of a, a sort of tragic twist to the end of the story. This is a guy that crossed the Atlantic as a, as a slave on a slave ship, um, and then lives his life in this in this world that he didn't choose, and ends up, you know, probably dying as a slave back on on ships sailing around the Caribbean. Um, second story. There's a woman. Her name is Isabel Toquero. There's her signature in her own hand up there. Um, this man actually has dates in it with a little bit of the storyline, so um, you can almost kind of follow the story yourself just by reading this. She's born out in Zonotake, which is uh, um, a primarily Maya community. Um, her classification, her ethno-racial classification in the documentation uh, varies. She's given at, at various points um, during um, what becomes her trial. Pretty much every mixed race label that you can think of that was being used in Colonia Yucatan in Mexico at the time uh, is applied to her. Um, her first husband is classified as a mestizo, but his father is a pardo, that's P-A-R-D-O, and that's supposed to be somebody who's of um, mixed indigenous and African descent, so the Afro-Maya, supposedly. Um, and the husband's um, first, her first mother-in-law, her first husband's mother is, is Maya, and she marries down here in Nabalam. There's Nabalam today, pretty looks. Well, I shouldn't say it looked a lot like that in the past, but that's what anthropologists do, though. <laughs> so I can say that. <laughs> Look at the stunning degree of material continuity. It's <laughs> just exactly the same. So that's a house right here. In fact, I have a feeling this isn't even. Does this even Nabalam? Did we just did we fudge this? This is, this is what happens when you get historians giving anthropology. <laughs> so she married here. Um, uh, you can see how old she is. She's young. She has four children, um, sort of, you know, immediately. Bam, bam, bam. Poor woman. And then um, one day, her husband uh, comes home from working in the in the fields and uh, finds her um, in uh, involved with her sister's husband, so one of her brother's in law. Um, he, he's completely naked except he has his hat on. 
<laughs> it's the only item of clothing he has on, and it's not clear how much clothing she has on, but certainly um, as little as is necessary to do what um, the husband claims they're doing. And he gets mad and attacks them and chases them, and the, um, his brother-in-law escapes out the window just with his hat on, nothing else, and jumps on a horse and takes off. Uh, I hope it was saddled, but either way. Uh, he chases his wife, too, who... Um, who f flees out of town to Tizimin, which is where the nearest Franciscan convent is, and she holds up in the convent. And, this is, and we haven't fudged this one. This really is the Franciscan church in Tizimin. Sort of fortress light, which is typical of um, Franciscan buildings in Yucatan. And she hides in there and is, and is given refuge by the, the, the Franciscan who's in charge of the convent and, and according to him the husband keeps coming around and threatening to kill her so in order to spare her life he takes her to his house in Mary. Uh, all Spaniards in Yucatan in the colonial period want to live in Mary. They don't want to live out in the boonies. Mary is the only city until Campeche is, is given city status in the late 18th century but even Campeche is pretty small. Valladolid also has town status, but it's, it's tiny and it's very few Spaniards live there. So it's not unusual for uh, a Franciscan whose responsibility is, is to this building out here to have a house in Merida. And, the, and Isabel Toquero is then put to work as a, as a servant of his, as a domestic servant in his house in Merida. Um, she's there for three years and then manages to get out of whatever kind of an informal contract he's placed her under. And she then remarries. Of course, her first husband is still alive, still out in Nabalam. And the priest who rescued her finds out that she's remarried and within two weeks has her arrested on, on a big So I think probably he's not, uh, maybe he's so principled that he feels he has to as the authorities, but uh, I suspect from reading the subsequent bigamy case trial, he does not come off as a very sympathetic character, and I suspect he was just mad that he's got this kind of free servant out of the deal and now she escaped. She's in jail in Merida. She's there for two years. She escapes a couple of times. At one point, there's a nice kind of climbing over the wall in the middle of the night type escape. Um, but you can't really hide anywhere um, in colonial Yucatan. The place is not that big and the population is even smaller and somewhere like Merida, everybody knows everybody. So she gets um, returned to jail pretty quickly. Uh, the wheels of the Inquisition move extremely slowly. It's not just that it takes a long time for the mail service to work, it takes a long time for people to generate the necessary documentation. Um, finally in 1705 she's sent down to Mexico City and she takes almost a year for her, as a prisoner of the Inquisition, to get from Merida down to Mexico City. The, Yucatan is effectively an island in the colonial period. You don't go in and out of Yucatan by land. You have to go to Campeche and then by, by sea across the Gulf of Mexico down to Veracruz and then up to Mexico City. <clears throat> she has to have the right proper escorts and there's like a pirate attack and so on. Um, she's convicted of, of bigamy in Mexico City uh, and uh, so, as requests to serve her time not in jail but in hospitals. Normally that's because it's easier to escape from hospitals. Uh, I don't think that was true in, in her case, but I haven't, you know, don't have enough kind of data to show that men are wanting to work in hospitals so they can escape and women are wanting to work in hospitals so they can actually do some good. But, so, and that's kind of gender stereotype, but the few cases I've seen seem to kind of fit that pattern. Uh, and, but she keeps getting sick. She's working in a hospital. And eventually she files a petition. She learns how to write while she's, what, during these years where she's serving her term, she gets freed and then she disappears. I don't know what happened to her after that. I suspect that she did not go back to um, the area of Yucatan, the rural area where she was born, to her first husband. I suspect she did not go back to Maryland look up her second husband, which she probably stayed in Mexico City and probably bigamously married again. Mexico City is far bigger. Mexico City is probably the only place 
um, in colonial, in New Spain, where you really could hide 